Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode four of my series, The Mexican-American War, 5440, or Fight. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, President Herrera debated recognition of Texas as an independent nation, but thought he could move slowly because President William Henry Harrison had no desire to annex Texas. However, Harrison died and was succeeded by John Tyler, his vice president. Refusing to listen to the leaders of his party, Tyler broke with the Whigs and governed essentially as an independent. Hoping to win a second term, Tyler adopted the cause of annexation of Texas to attract enough Whig and Democratic support to win re-election. The support did not materialize, but annexation became the dominant issue in the 1844 election. When former President Martin Van Buren publicly renounced support for annexation, Andrew Jackson pulled his support from his former vice president and backed James Polk, who campaigned on a promise to annex Texas and won the election against Henry Clay. Polk definitely wanted a war, and he wanted the spoils of war, namely California and New Mexico. He also wanted Oregon, although preferably without a war. As a result, Polk deliberately left the definition of Oregon vague, but when British Ambassador Pakenham rejected Polk's offer of the 49th parallel without a counteroffer, Polk adopted a more aggressive approach. In fact, the mood of the country had become aggressive following his election as the phrase 5440 or fight spread through the North and a journalist named John L. O'Sullivan first used the phrase manifest destiny in the summer of 1845, claiming that Americans were destined to expand across North America. Actually, the Democratic Party was divided between those who wanted to compromise at the 49th parallel to avoid war and those who were willing to fight if the new border was anything other than 5440, which would have given the United States most of modern British Columbia. The southern senators led by Calhoun did not care about Oregon, but the northwest senators knew that a compromise would be deeply unpopular in their region and would likely cost them many seats in the midterm elections. In fact, the two factions began attacking each other in the Senate, which reflected the fact that Polk had been a compromise candidate and did not control his own party. Or more accurately, the party had genuine divisions and Polk could not unite the factions. War with Britain seemed likely when Prime Minister Robert Peel fell from power over a dispute related to the nation's protectionist trade laws, the Corn Laws. Lord John Russell, leader of the opposition and a strong opponent of the American claim to Oregon, nearly became prime minister but could not gain enough support in Parliament, so Queen Victoria asked Peel to try again. Peel succeeded after he devised a repeal of the Corn Law and he kept Lord Aberdeen as foreign minister. Once the Corn Laws were repealed, Peel knew that he needed the United States as a trading partner, not an enemy, so he wanted to settle the Oregon issue and avoid a war. As a result, on October 22, 1845, an embarrassed Ambassador Pakenham informed Secretary of State Buchanan that he regretted the withdrawal of the 49th parallel offer without mentioning that he had been reprimanded by Foreign Secretary Aberdeen for not consulting with London before rejecting the offer. To be honest, there was little domestic pressure for the British to fight for Oregon. The vast majority of settlers in the disputed area were American because the Hudson's Bay Company governed the British side and the company only cared about the fur trade, not settlement. Since the trade was declining and the flow of American settlers was growing, the company decided on its own to relocate to Vancouver Island, so there was no domestic group pushing the British government to stand firm in Oregon. Admittedly, there were hawkish Democratic congressmen shouting 54-40 or fight, but Polk did not seem to take them seriously because he did not plan to run for re-election. While the Oregon issue appeared to have been resolved peacefully, the situation was the opposite regarding Mexico. 
War had not been declared, but over the course of the summer of 1845, nearly 4,000 American soldiers traveled from coastal forts and remote frontier posts to the coastal Texan settlement of Corpus Christi, where General Zachary Taylor spent several months training them to fight as an army. Polk planned to negotiate with Mexico and hopefully arrange the annexation without war, but he still sent General Taylor with an army to camp near the Rio Grande in the fall of 1845, just in case. Taylor was not the senior general, but his superiors, Winfield Scott and Edmund Gaines, were both Whigs. Well, admittedly, Taylor was also a Whig, but he had never displayed much interest in politics, unlike Scott, who had campaigned for the presidential nomination. So Polk had little desire to create a war hero in the rival party. The soldiers' official purpose was the protection of recently annexed Texas. However, the location was an odd choice to protect Texas, since it was far from the region that had frequently suffered Mexican raids. Admittedly, it was relatively easy to supply by sea, but the main attraction seems to have been its location near the Mexican town of Matamoros, which had been coveted by expansionist Texans. The Mexican government might have been persuaded to accept the loss of Texas, but Polk was pushing for a new boundary that stretched to the Pacific, which would give the United States modern Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, and California. He was willing to pay for those lands, and pay a lot, but he was not willing to accept no for an answer. While Texas had obvious value, few officials in Washington expressed much enthusiasm for New Mexico, which was mostly desert. Polk did not try to change their minds. He simply wanted New Mexico because it was necessary to pass through the region to reach California with its undeniably valuable ports on the west coast. Still, there was a growing enthusiasm for a railroad that would link New York and Washington with Southern California, moving through Missouri and Kansas and then following the Santa Fe Trail. Mexico had ended diplomatic relations with the United States after it annexed Texas, but President Herrera had stated that he would meet with the special commissioner to discuss Texas. Whether Herrera could have convinced the legislature to accept the annexation of Texas is unknown, but unlikely, even though he personally recognized that Texas was too remote. Except Polk appointed John Slidell, a Democratic congressman from Louisiana, as a replacement for the recently departed American ambassador. Chosen for his loyalty to Polk, Slidell himself was surprised that he had been offered the position. Herrera refused to meet with Slidell because it would indicate that he had restored diplomatic relations with the United States. Asked by Secretary of State Buchanan to remain in Mexico a bit longer so the government could claim that it had made a serious attempt at diplomacy, Slidell wrote Polk that a war would probably be the best mode of settling our affairs with Mexico. In the end, sending a secret envoy whose single instruction was an offer to buy California while massing troops on the border did not signal a genuine willingness to negotiate. It is worth pointing out that Polk had stated that he was willing to go to war with England, but had not placed troops near Oregon or Canada. Herrera had accepted that Texas could not be defended, but an American invasion of Mexico was far from impossible. So he had ordered General Mariano Paredes to organize an army of 12,000 men and march them to Monterrey, where they would be ready to reinforce the garrison at Matamoros. Why not simply station the army at Matamoros? Well... San Luis Potosi, the nearest state with good agriculture, was a couple of weeks' march through arid land, so badly supplied trips genuinely risked starvation. Supply by sea was impossible since American warships controlled the region. Actually, the more immediate danger was Paredes, who had led two separate coups against presidents and clearly felt that he deserved to be president. Still, Paredes would undoubtedly realize that Mexico was in a dangerous situation and focus on the possibility of an invasion. Unfortunately, Paredes saw the situation differently. Fearing that the traditional hierarchy and the propertied class were threatened by Herrera's moderate republicanism, he planned a coup with monarchists. To be fair, he believed that Taylor's army was simply on the border as a warning for Mexico to not interfere in the annexation of Texas, so he did not worry that he was endangering Mexico by taking his army to Mexico City to carry out a coup. Oddly enough, 
Paredes had helped Herrera overthrow Santa Ana a year before he overthrew Herrera. Given the increasing possibility of a war, this is a good time to explain who exactly made up the American army. Aside from the native-born Protestant officers from the middle class and upper class, the army was mainly composed of poor men recruited from eastern cities, men who could not find steady employment and had joined the army in search of regular meals. Unskilled laborers in cities filled with other unskilled laborers chasing too few jobs, their numbers grew every time a ship arrived with more immigrants from Europe. Since the army could only attract desperate men, soldiers were viewed as lazy failures by the general populace. In particular, free men despised them for agreeing to a system that employed corporal punishment, including flogging, which should be reserved for animals and slaves. The soldiers served more as laborers than fighters on the frontier where they built forts, barracks, bridges, and grew crops. Even so, the brutality combined with days without food and months without pay would spur desertion. Strange as it may sound, desertion was actually caused more by economic opportunity than harsh punishment. In particular, the soldiers knew that there was an overabundance of labor in the cities, but a severe lack on the frontier. Transportation to the frontier was expensive, so many enlisted and then deserted once they had reached the frontier. While American soldiers were volunteers driven to enlist by poverty, Mexican soldiers were largely conscripts, rounded up by local authorities which were required by the state government to contribute a certain number of men from their districts in order to fulfill the state's obligation to the central government, so the men were usually poor or were considered troublemakers by local officials. If there were not enough troublemakers or rootless young men, some married men would be drafted. Since it was nearly impossible for the poor men to send money home, if they were even paid regularly, their wives accompanied the army. American observers were stunned by the large numbers of women who accompanied Mexican armies, presuming that they were prostitutes, when they were actually wives who would starve at home. Given the widespread poverty in rural Mexico, the prospect of infrequent meals was still better than starvation, which made soldiers more attractive partners. Despite these problems, Mexican soldiers possessed astonishing endurance and would not easily break under fire, probably because they were used to harsh lives. Following Slidell's failed negotiations, Polk had his excuse to adopt a more aggressive approach. On January 13, 1846, Secretary of War Marcy sent a message to General Taylor, who was still at Corpus Christi. Sir, I am directed by the President to instruct you to advance and occupy with the troops under your command positions on or near the east bank of the Rio del Norte. Still, the message did not directly order Taylor to start a war. However, the message made it clear that a war would not be a bad thing. It is not designed in our present relations with Mexico that you should treat her as an enemy. But should she assume that character by a declaration of war or any open act of hostility towards us, you will not act merely on the defensive if your relative means enable you to act otherwise. Despite the nice words that Mexico should not be treated as an enemy, Polk's order to Taylor to camp directly opposite Matamoros was a deliberate provocation. He basically believed that the Mexican government would either be intimidated into agreeing to his demands to avoid a war, or would fight, quickly lose, and then accept his demands. This strategy made sense if Mexico had no real attachment to Texas. However, both Mexico and the United States were republics where political power was based on popular support. Still, the Mexican government was well aware that geography made it practically impossible to maintain control over these territories, and even harder to defend them. So, why fight? One factor was a growing realization in Mexico that the United States was an expansionist nation, not a neighborly fellow republic, and it intended to expand at the expense of Mexico. In fact, the Texan revolt had sparked a Mexican nationalism, which made a practical acknowledgement of geopolitical realities difficult. 
When Taylor placed his army across from Matamoros on March 28th, the residents of the town were not happy to see an American army camp across the river, but otherwise ignored them. General Pedro de Ampudio appeared with reinforcements on April 11th and sent an ultimatum, leave or fight. Taylor replied that he had orders and would not fire the first shot. Possessing a reputation for cruelty and incompetence, Ampudia was eager for battle, but his officers refused to disobey their original orders, so nothing happened until the more professional General Mariano Arista arrived to take charge. Since the Mexicans ignored the provocation, Taylor's greatest problem proved to be desertion, since the Mexicans tried to lure their fellow Catholics to cross the river. Sentries killed two men swimming, but 200 men deserted, attracted by the hope of a more welcoming environment which they had failed to find in the United States. Why so many deserters? The majority of the officers were Protestant, while 40% of the soldiers were recent immigrants, foreign-born, Germans, and Irish, almost all Catholic. The Irish soldiers in the regular army were frequently assigned hard duty, forbidden to openly practice their religion, routinely discriminated against, called mix or potato heads, and passed over for promotion. Meanwhile, they were part of a Protestant army that had invaded a fellow Catholic nation. Just as their own Catholic nation had been invaded by Protestants, so the temptation to switch sides was understandable. As I said, the Mexican army at Matamoros had been waiting for General Arista. Well, he arrived on April 23rd, and he was eager to fight. Arista sent 1,600 cavalry to cross the Rio Grande, and they ambushed a much smaller American patrol led by Captain Seth Thornton on April 23rd in what became known as the Thornton Affair. Three days later, Taylor notified Washington that hostilities had commenced. To sum up, President Polk avoided war with Britain over Oregon because the British Prime Minister needed the United States as a trading partner more than he needed a distant colony. However, negotiations with Mexico stalled when General Mariano Paredes seized power because he thought that President Herrera was too liberal. Polk then ordered General Taylor to place his army directly across from the Mexican town of Matamoros, and Mexican troops attacked a smaller American patrol, giving Polk his excuse to declare war. I will discuss the progress of the war and the surprising return of Santa Ana next episode. Thanks for listening.